good morning. Welcome to Law Power Hour and happy Labor Day weekend. Uh, good morning, Manny Kavaja. Good morning to you. How are you? I'm well, thank you. Pull up a little closer to that mic. Because, Absolutely. Because you have so much to share with us today. Manny Kavaja is an immigration lawyer, and I am excited that he volunteered on the Labor Day weekend to come down here and share with us some of the problems we're having immigration. Uh, Manny, where are your offices located? I have, I have one office located in Birmingham, uh, Michigan, and the other one is in Dearborn, Michigan. If our listeners want to get a hold of you because they have friends that are having immigration problems, how do they find you? Um, they could do a Google search, um, look up my name, M-A-N-I is the first name, last name is K-H-A-V-A-J-I-A-N, or they could simply just call 248-875-9770. Now, your specialty is criminal and immigration law. Correct. Because they go together like hand and glove. Absolutely. So if you have a green card, for example, and I want you to explain to our listeners what a green card is. Okay. A green card is basically a document. The green card is actually the card itself, and it's, it's not green, <laughs> um, but it's basically permission to legally and permanently reside in the United States. So it's not a temporary thing. You are allowed to use it and remain here um, as long as you'd like. Eventually you can become a U.S. citizen after having your green card for some time. But when you're in the immigration process, if you get into trouble with the law, you can lose mm -hmm. your right to become an immigrant. Is that correct? Absolutely. If, if, if you get in trouble, if you get criminal violations, there's numerous, numerous violations, even misdemeanors, that will strip you of your, of your eligibility for the green card. You will be placed in uh, deportation proceedings and the government will basically try to send you back to your home country for certain uh, criminal violations. And that's why it's really important for people to understand that if you have a criminal charge and you're in the immigration process, you need a lawyer who understands the rules. And I mean the rules because they're very specific mm -hmm. rules that apply to immigration status that can be impacted by a criminal charge. You're involved in one of those cases right now. A absolutely, absolutely. Right now we're working on a case um, for a lady who basically years ago uh, pled guilty to a criminal violation after being reassured and reassured and reassured by her criminal defense attorney that it would not trigger deportation. And today she's detained at an um, immigration detention facility, no eligibility for bond, so she doesn't get to see a judge and ask to be released and go home to her, her family while she fights the case. She's stuck in a jail. Um, she's going to be having a deportation hearing in the very, very near future, and if we don't uh, go back and vacate that criminal case, which was induced under ineffective assistance of counsel, that's how they persuaded her to plead guilty in the first place, was by telling her that you're not going to get deported for this if you plea. She pled, she trusted her lawyer, and at the end of the day, immigration came and picked her up, placed her in immigration removal proceedings, um, put her in a jail where she can't even ask a judge for a bond, and she's awaiting to see what her faith is based on the poor decision provided by her former criminal attorney. Okay, let's clear the air on this a little bit. How long ago did she plead? She pled in 2012. Okay, so she pled five years ago. Right. So after she pled for five years, she's walking around, right. conducting business, then someone did a search on her. Right. When they did the search, Immigration Naturalization Service came out. Mm -hmm. That's the United States Marshal, by the way, coming out, and they arrested her. Right. And when she's detained, she has no opportunity to communicate with anyone because they quarantine you. Basically, fortunately, she, she did get a hold of an immigration attorney. The immigration attorney did go to the detention center, so she did have you know, a link to the outside. That immigration attorney contacted me, and we filed the motion to vacate her criminal case. So hopefully that will go through okay, and we can get her out of there. You see, someone in this country used the term detention center. And as far back as the Second World War, and people in this country don't want to accept the mm -hmm. fact that foreigners, Japanese in particular, were put in detention centers while the war was on. Absolutely. They called them internment camps at right. that time. Uh, one of them was at Santa Anita Racetrack in California. Mm -hmm. I was born in California, had a lot of my friends that were in the internment camp that were born there. Mm -hmm. So they confiscated their property, they took away their rights, and this poor woman 
They confiscate her property, take away her rights, and she's got to go back to where? Um, it, her, her country of nationality is Mexico. So that's where she would end up if she was not able to prevail in court. And if she is forced, why, is she illegal? No, she had a green card. Um, everything was good, and then she got into a little bit of legal trouble and took the advice, the false advice of her criminal defense attorney um, and pled guilty. And in my you know, humble opinion, she pled guilty based on an ineffective assistance of counsel received from her criminal lawyer. So she was not afforded the very, very basic right to be represented by a competent attorney in the criminal court. And that's, that's a right that every single person, all defendants, regardless of your race, religion, ethnicity, citizenship status, have when you set foot on American soil. It's a very, very basic constitutional right that all defendants should receive. Now, a lot of people are saying, well, why are you having this show on today, Mr. Keller? What's so important about it? Well, this is a fact of life. We're all immigrants. That's right. Everyone who lives in the United States is an immigrant, comes from an immigrant family. Mm -hmm. Whether your family came from Africa or South America or Russia or Iran, like your, your family right. came from Iran or Egypt, we're all Americans. Absolutely. We're all living in America. And that's why cultural diversity makes this country really great. Mm -hmm. But the point is, and this is the most important point, all of our rights can be taken away with the flick of a big pen. That's true. And the President of the United States, Donald Trump, is in the process of doing that right now. And I know this, this sounds very political, and it is political, because he's trying to undo something with an executive order that President Obama did with an executive order. Is Absolutely. that true? Absolutely it is, and I think you were referring to the DACA program, uh, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. I'm driving down here in my car, I'm listening to the news on the way down, NPR, and I hear the DACA decision's coming down on Tuesday. Right. And for all of you who are out there, whether you're involved in it or not, it's important for you to understand what's going on in this country because by executive order, by executive order, the President of the United States can take away, or use the term, eradicate, wipe out your rights if he chooses to. That's, that's absolutely correct. And then we got to go to court, and I used to say, got to go. We have to kind of go to court. And we have to fight it out mm -hmm. in court to get our rights back. Absolutely. So on Tuesday, if he signs an order saying that all of the DACA children, mm -hmm. and we're talking about 800,000 DACA children, That's right. are going to be forced to leave the country. He's going to try to force them to leave, but thank God we got some immigration attorneys that will put up a good fight before we'll allow that to happen. Um, a lot of these kids have been brought here since they were very, very young. Um, DACA requires you to have been brought to the United States when you were under the age of 16, so it's for... Okay, let's, let's break this down a okay. little bit. You come to the United States. Mom and Pop decide to immigrate to the United States. Mm -hmm. Your parents did that. Right. My dad did that. Okay? Mm -hmm. So when you immigrate to the United States... They brought you along, right? Absolutely. I didn't have a choice. Okay. How old were you? I was four years old. Okay. So here he is. He's four years old. I mean, technically, I could put you under the DACA umbrella if, if you were younger. Well, DACA is reserved for, for people who either came into the country without permission or folks who came in on a temporary visa and then overstayed the visa. I, I came in with, with a green card. So technically, I wouldn't, I wouldn't qualify, but I, I definitely see the links that, that are there. Okay. You know? so so people who overstayed or came in without permission, mm -hmm. they gave them the right to continue to go to school and complete their education here. Right. But because President Obama wants to engage in what we call isolationism, mm -hmm. meaning he wants to take care of the white folks in America. I mean, President Trump. I mean, President Trump, rather, wants to engage in isolationism. Right. He wants to take care of his folks and he wants everyone else to leave the country because he thinks he's going to do better for the country that's i guess that's what he hopes and i can't see any kind of rational basis in that um he's the american president he should be protecting all folks living in the united states not just his base or just people who look like him or maybe are a couple tints of orange less than him but 
Um, he's, he's not doing right by the nation. If he were to deport all these children, um, over the next 10 years, our economy is going to lose, you know, over four billion, four hundred billion dollars in in assets, and that's nothing any any good reasonable president should do. That's not anything any good businessman should do. So I just don't see where his rationale can come from trying to kick these kids out of the country. Now I want you to call in today if you have any immigration questions because this is a highly sensitive issue, especially with all of the illegals that are being forced to go home. Is that true? Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Um, you know, first of all, I, I, I got to take a little issue with, with the term illegals. Um, no human being in the United States is illegal. They're undocumented. Um, only an act can be deemed illegal in the United States. A person's status cannot be. So they're, they're undocumented. Um, some of them have an opportunity to get documents. Some don't. But, you know, before that ever happens, they, they would probably have to see an immigration judge or go through USCIS to, you know, get some waivers, file some forms. Some have relief available to them. Others don't. So it's, it's very case-specific. I know, but people spent thousands of dollars to come into this country mm -hmm. through different pipelines. Mm -hmm. For example, we had the situation down in Texas before Harvey, mm -hmm. where all these people, they found them uh, in a parking lot of a Kroger's mm -hmm. inside a truck, and many of them unfortunately died. Mm -hmm. Well, they, they must have spent thousands of dollars sure. to get transported in, in an attempt to come into the country. Mm -hmm. So they weren't legal when they came into the country. They, yeah, they entered the country without, without permission, without proper inspection, absolutely. Okay, so when you enter the country without proper inspection and without papers, you're not allowed to come in the country, are right. you? Right, yeah, absolutely. You're here without permission. You did not obey the proper immigration laws when entering the nation. That's absolutely true. I mean, I, I was coming home from uh, France about uh, six weeks ago, and there was a lady sat down on the plane. And all of a sudden, the stewardess came and said to her, you know, you got to get up, you got to go. She said, why? She explained to her, you have no papers. So you can't sit here, you can't fly from France to the United States. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as you arrive in the United States, you're going to be detained. You're going to be detained, and they're going to flip the bill for sending you back to France to the airline that brought you here. So <laughs> she, she definitely doesn't want her um, coming to the United States via that airline. Okay, we're going to take a break for a minute. We'll be right back. And I'd like to have some calls in today, please. Are you in legal trouble? Are you in need of legal advice? Or just have general legal questions? Watch Law Power Hour and get your questions answered by experienced attorneys who are experts in their field. Know your rights. Watch Law Power Hour hosted by Barry Keller, attorney at law. Saturdays at 11 a.m. here on WHPR Detroit Live. What's the solution for DACA? Um, the, the solution for me uh, would be basically to advise you know everyone who is on the DACA program that there is re relief available after DACA. Should, should uh, President Trump decide to eradicate this program, um, which would definitely not be in the best interest of, of the nation, but if he decides to do so, um, these folks, a lot of them would qualify for what's called cancellation of removal. Um, for cancellation of removal, to be eligible for it, you would have to show that you've been president in the United States for at least 10 years, that um, you're a person of good moral character, and that you have um, a U.S. citizen, wife, child, or parent that would suffer extreme and exceptionally unusual hardship if the alien were to be deported. 
So um, if DACA was canceled, it wouldn't be the end of the day. You know, they would still, you know, they would obviously be arrested by immigration agents. They would be given the opportunity to seek a bond from an immigration judge as long as they don't have criminal convictions. Um, and that judge can release them and then they can work towards their cancellation of removal cases or other relief if that's available to them. So they do have an opportunity to fight and, and stay here and have a judge decide their case and it wouldn't, everything wouldn't be taken away from them with just, you know, the, the strike of a pen from the president. But immigration cases are really expensive, aren't they? They're very expensive. They're very expensive. They're highly complicated. Um, fortunately, there there are numerous uh, nonprofit organizations who have stepped up, especially since the the election of our current president, to to fill in the gap for folks who cannot afford a private attorney. Would you tell our audience a little bit about the not-for-profit programs that are available? A absolutely. Um, there's numerous organizations. Um, Merck is one of them, Justice for Our ne Neighbors is another one, Freedom House, uh, it's right here in, in Detroit, I think it's, it's the only facility of its sort um, in the United States, and we have a lot of great resources here um, that can help folks that are low income. Unfortunately, immigration law is not like criminal law where if, you know, the defendant can't afford an attorney, one will be provided to them, you know, at the cost of the state. Nothing like that exists, so unfortunately if, if, the, if the immigrant does not have funds or family members don't have funds, friends can't come up with the money, um, they wouldn't be able to hire a private lawyer. So that's where these nonprofits step in and, and provide really, really great help, exceptional help for no cost or, or very, very low cost. So there is a safety net out there. So people who have problems can contact you? Absolutely. Okay, give them a number where they can reach you and tell them what languages Absolutely. can be provided to assist these individuals. Absolutely. So if anyone out there listening has, has any issues or they have loved ones who have issues with immigration, you can always reach out to my office. Uh, the phone number is 248-875-9770. I personally speak Farsi. Um, I have a good friend of mine who assists me who's uh, fluent in Spanish, and then we have a paralegal at the Dearborn office who's fluent in Arabic. So. Um, we're here to help. If you don't speak English, that's not a problem. Um, we have people standing by that would definitely be able to assist you in your own native language. Now, immigration law is very interesting because if I have special skills, and I'm going to shift gears and go right down the line here, and I've got special skills. I, uh, I'm a well-known surgeon in my country, and I've developed a special procedure for doing neck surgery, mm -hmm. and it's recognized throughout the world, because of my special skills, I'm going to get a visa if I apply to the United States. Is we that could, correct? We could get you a green card. We can get you better than a visa. So if you got skills that great, you could definitely come to the country with a green card. Um, there is an employment-based category, the EV-1, is for um, individuals with extraordinary ability. So if you're the number one surgeon, you're, you're here to save lives. Like. Absolutely, where you'd be able to get a green card to come to the United States. If I'm a great cook, if you're if you're one of the best in, in the world, absolutely. We can, again, you can come to the United States and bring your your extraordinary skills here and, and get a green card with that. Now, if I get a green card and I'm a great cook and I want to bring my family along, can I bring my family along? Absolutely. Do they get an EB1? Um, it's it's a different category, but it will be basically attached to your to your EB1 status and. As long as you know they're they're direct immediate uh, family members, wife, children, absolutely they can come in. If your children are above the age of 21, they might not be able to come in immediately with you, but you could apply for them to to join you afterwards. Now we need a lot of engineers in the United States. Absolutely. We we understand there's a shortage of engineers, and they're high paying jobs. There's also a shortage of doctors mm -hmm. and nurses. Okay, so they're eligible for what we call EB ones. Mm -hmm. Well, not everyone's eligible for an EB-1. Um, a lot of engineers, folks like that, would be eligible for the H-1B, which basically only requires you to have um, uh, a bachelor's degree and have a U.S. employer want to give you a job, and they don't have U.S. employers that are qualified for that position. I'm sorry, U.S. US employees, employees that are qual qualified, qualified for, that, for position. that position. Right. Okay, well, how do you differentiate as to whether they're qualified or not? Engineers and engineer all day long. Ba basically, the, the employer will be required to put out ads um, to hire for that position, and after they've done so for a certain period of time, if they're not able to find individuals who are qualified for that position, they can start looking outside of the country for help. So is it, is it a complicated process for someone from a foreign country to get a status if they're educated? 
and they have special skills to come to the United it's, States. It's a little complicated, but usually the, the U.S. Um, business would hire the immigration attorney to do the, to do the legal work on behalf of the business. So that's, that's the nice portion of it for, for the immigrant actually coming in. They're not the one flipping the bill. They're not the one looking for the attorney. Usually it's the employer and the business who, who handles all of that. Okay, now that's the pretty side of immigration, isn't it? That is. That is the pretty side. Now we're going to get to the ugly side of immigration. We go to Southwest Detroit, mm -hmm. and in Southwest Detroit, we're very fortunate. We have a wonderful Hispanic community Absolutely. in the Clark Park area. Mm -hmm. And I know there are listeners out there who have friends in Clark Park area or who go down to the Hispanic community. I don't like to refer to it as Mexican town because it's Hispanic community because it's multi multicultural Hispanics mm -hmm. from various parts of Central America and Latin America. So a lot of the people down there <coughs> don't have papers, do True. they? True. And they're subject to deportation. That's absolutely correct. And they've got these beautiful looking children. Absolutely. Bright eyed, beautiful looking children who are going to school. Right. And if their parents get deported, they're going to be orphans. Right. But I had beautiful U.S. citizen children for the most part. Because they're born here, that's so right. they're citizens. That's right. Okay. But they're still going to be orphans. That's, that's true. They're either going to be orphans or they're going to have to go back with mom and dad and live in a country where they're foreign to. So what do you do when you represent one of these people, Manny? This is really... It's a very sensitive issue, mm -hmm. but it's a very important issue. Mm -hmm. I mean, whether it's in Detroit or in Saginaw or in Flint, I know there are a lot of mm -hmm. people who are, I'm going to be polite, undocumented. <laughs> Thank you. They're, yeah, they're, they're all over the place. And, um, you know, it's really a, a case-specific inquiry that you have to do to know who you can help and who you can't. Um, a lot of these folks, like I had mentioned before, would be eligible for what's called cancellation of removal. Um, other folks might be eligible for asylum, withholding of removal, the Convention Against Torture if they're fearful that someone's going to harm them if they're sent back to their home country. Hold, hold the fort here. Okay. You're talking about a lot of issues right. here. Okay. And these are important. You know, if you don't know anything about immigration, at least this is a good education class for you today. You use the term uh, eligibility for asylum. Mm -hmm. So I'm here. I'm not documented. And I say to you, you know, I come in your office and I say, hey, you got to help me. If I go back home to Mexico, mm -hmm. I was a member of a leftist organization in Mexico. And I did not support, support the president. And they are putting everyone who belonged to my organization in jail. Mm -hmm. I want to stay here. Can you help me? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. What are you going to do for me? Um, we would fill out the application for, for asylum. And one of the categories, it's not enough that someone's going to harm you. It has to be the harm or the persecution is based on a particular enumeration in the law. And political opinion is one of those things. So if, if the persecution is going to be um, brought towards you from the government because of your political beliefs, that's, that's, a, that's a valid claim for asylum. So we would work. Um, with you to get the story out, make sure we have all the facts straight. You're really being, you know, persecuted because of your political opinion. It's not because the political organization is also engaged in criminal acts, but it's because of your political opinion. Um, we would put together a, a great application for you. We'd go through all the facts, make sure we have everything, all of our, you know, I's dotted, T's crossed. We have all the facts. We would gather evidence, you know, newspaper articles, State Department reports of the actual persecution taking place in Mexico, and we'd attach that to your application, include affidavits, any evidence we have, if there's been any arrests in Mexico, if there's, you know, doctors or family members or anyone there who's aware of what's going on, we'd get affidavits from all those folks. Um, we'd submit that to the immigration court, and then one day we would get our day in court. And when we have our day in court, you would be able to testify and let the judge know why you fled Mexico, who's trying to harm you, the fear that you think would be placed upon you uh, upon your return. And at the end of the day, the judge would get to decide whether or not you get to remain, whether he believes, A, if you're being credible, and B, you know, 
if the harm is, is actually attached to your political beliefs. Now, if I have been involved in any criminal activity in the United States, whether it be drunk driving, which is a misdemeanor, mm -hmm. but still something that involves state of mind, mm -hmm. moral turpitude, mm -hmm. or any other act that involves state of mind, a legal act, I may not be eligible for asylum. Is that correct? Um, I don't think one DUI would make you ineligible. So when you do have criminal convictions and, and you're qualified for, for asylum, the judge would basically do an inquiry to think, you know, is the persecution that he would face, does that outweigh his criminal history in the United States? Now, if you have one DUI and you're going to be persecuted, I think the judge would let you stay. But if you're a serial killer, absolutely not. You know, you're not going to be able to stay here if you have horrendous, you know, felonies on your record. But if it's a more of, um, and I hate to say petty offense, but if it's it's something lesser, you know, it, it wasn't it wasn't done with with the, the reckless intent to like you know kill and, and murder people, and it was on the on the lighter end of the, the criminal spectrum. Yeah, absolutely, you'd be able to stay. But with more severe crimes, absolutely not. With the political sentiment that exists in Washington, do you believe that the immigration judges? are leaning towards the current administration in denying asylum? Um, so one of, the, one of the things with immigration law is that there's really not a whole lot of uniformity. Um, you could be in one judge's courtroom that gives great rulings with a, a certain set of facts, and then you could walk across the hall, go to another judge's courtroom, have basically the same set of facts and have a completely different outcome. So I don't think, you know, the judges are really, you know, in line with the Trump administration and, you know, basically backing him. Some are, you know, some of them who politically are aligned with him, absolutely. But other judges are not, and, and I think they see that they are, you know, basically the silver lining of, of reasonability between, you know, the folks and, and the administration. We're going to take a break. When I come back, I'm going to really stick my neck out and ask you a very important question okay. about immigration. Sounds good. Okay. Are you in legal trouble? Are you in need of legal advice? Or just have general legal questions? Watch Law Power Hour and get your questions answered by experienced attorneys who are experts in their field. Know your rights. Watch Law Power Hour hosted by Barry Keller, attorney at law. Saturdays at 11 a.m. here on WHPR, Detroit Live. we were off the air, Manny said to me, he said, would you add, tell me what the question is? I said, no, <laughs> I'm not going to tell you what the question is because it's a real important question. <laughs> I have a lot of clients who apply for SSI benefits and they get turned down and they have a lot of people that they know who come to the United States and they get approved from the Middle East and they've never worked. Mm -hmm. And they want to pull their hair out. So my first question is, do you think it's fair that people who have medical problems should be allowed to immigrate to the United States? And, I, and, and this is a very important question. Mm -hmm. Do you think that we should be paying the cost of people who are sponsored by their families? Okay. Mm -hmm legitimately sponsored by their families with medical problems. You think they should be allowed to come to the United States and go into the system and draw welfare and other benefits? Um, I told you I'm going to put you on the spot. <laughs> I, 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 Absolutely. So um, first of all, a lot of these folks wouldn't be eligible for any, any form of welfare until they've, they've been living in the United States for at least five years, even if they have a green card. Um, second of all, um, I, I, don't, I don't know when we're talking about fairness, if we're talking about a medical issue, absolutely. I think everyone has a right to have the best medical care possible to them. 
um, if there's a hospital in the United States that's willing to take these folks in and they're the only hospital that can do the proper surgery, I mean, we have some of the best doctors in the world. We allow green cards for that purpose for them to come here. So um, when it's a matter of life and death, it's, it's not a hard decision for me, absolutely. I think they should be allowed to come here. I think they should be able to receive the best medical attention possible. And there are actually insurance companies who would insure individuals that are coming to the United States for medical care. Okay, now, for those individuals who claim that they're physically incapable of working, many of them use their inability to speak and understand English language mm -hmm. as one of the factors in getting disability benefits mm -hmm. because they're not literate mm -hmm. in English. That was the second part I okay. wanted to ask you about. Do you think that everyone who comes to this country should be forced to take literacy classes? I know when you came, you were little, and you learned. I learned in, in kindergarten. <laughs> you learned in kindergarten to speak English. Right. So you're very fortunate. Absolutely. But older people who come to this country, it's do you think difficult. that it's important for them to be required to take English as a second language as a requirement of becoming a United States citizen? I told you this is a very tough question. Sure. And it's, it's, it's a very important sure. question. Uh, I'm not hesitant to ask the question. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 in the United States, we don't have a national language. Um, there's no law that says English is the language that you must speak in the United States. Um, if folks want to live in a country like that, they could move to India. I mean, that's the national language in India. But we're in the United States where we value freedoms, we value individuality, and I don't think it would be right to say, you know, in order for you to immigrate to this country, you must learn this language. You know, there, there's plenty of folks that can come here, you know, let's say, you know, I want to bring my, my, my great-great-grandfather here. He, he's passed away now, but let's say he wasn't, and let's say I wanted to bring him here. If he's an older gentleman, he's 90 some years old, he's going to be living with me, I'm going to be taking care of all of his bills, he's going to be surrounded by folks that speak Farsi, why in the world would he have to learn English to come here? You know, he's not in the workforce, he's not going to be harm harming anyone by not knowing the language, he just wants to be with his family. He wants to spend, you know, the last few years of his life being around his loved ones. And to say that you're not allowed to come here because you don't speak English, I think is absurd. Okay, I just wanted to Get that out here because it's an important issue. Mm -hmm. Because many people feel that they're denied opportunities because foreign individuals are given preferences when they immigrate to this country. Mm -hmm. and, and it becomes a big issue. Mm -hmm. So let's get to the next issue here, which is really, really important. What do you think should be done with all of the undocumented individuals. How should this be handled? Suppose that you could wave the Manny wand here. What would you do to protect all the undocumented individuals? And I want you to break it down mm -hmm. in terms of categories. I want you to break it down in terms of those who've committed crimes in their own countries and those who've committed crimes in the United States. Mm -hmm. And, and this is very important because I want people to understand the fairness of your thinking. Mm -hmm. I want them to understand that if they have someone who has a problem, I want them to call you. Mm -hmm. So let's deal with this. Okay. I'm here, I'm undocumented, I want to stay in this country, and I was a bank robber <laughs> in uh, Portugal. Mm -hmm. I gave you a country that is really not on on the radar right, any place. Right, right. Okay. So um, if, if you're a bank robber and you've, you've, you've either admitted to being a bank robber or um, you've been convicted of it, you're going to be deported. Um, once, once they realize that you're in the United States without permission, you're going to be deported. And um, if you were a violent bank robber, I'm, I'm probably not going to be in a position to be able to defend you. I mean, we need to show that you were not convicted of certain crimes, whether in the United States or abroad before you'd be eligible for a lot of the forms of relief. However, if you were a bank robber, um, and let's say you were one of the best bank robbers in Portugal, and the, the government in Portugal would be willing to, to torture you once, once you were returned to, their home, to, their, to your home country, um, we could definitely defend the case. We could get you to be able to stay here. But um, at the end of the day, personally, I think you know, folks who, who are violent criminals have, have no right to, to, to come to the United States or remain here. Um, but the over 
overwhelming majority of folks that are here undocumented are not criminals. They are just folks seeking a better life for their children. They're here to work. They're here to provide a better life for their kids. They're, they're escaping some dangers back home. But the overwhelming majority of them have no criminal record. So um, one of the, and when I said, you know, I don't like when folks call them uh, illegals is because the term illegal kind of makes you feel that, wait, there is something criminal about this individual and it kind of dehumanizes, dehumanizes them. And uh, they're not, they're not criminals. They're just folks here for a better life. And that's, that's the reason this country was created. I mean, the pilgrims came here for a better life. And I don't, I don't remember them asking for visas before they came either. Well, they did interfere with the Native Americans, right. okay? We, it's another issue. Sure. And taking property from sure. the Native Americans. I mean, the Native Americans had to fight a battle to right. get it back, and they won the hard way. They got casinos. But <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that was a... Right. I'm, I'm not making the joke. It's a big trade-off mm -hmm. here that they ended up with the casinos mm -hmm. on the reservations. Right. But that's a heck of a way of getting reparation 250 years later. Right. Here's the, here, here's the question that I had about this. So I'm undocumented, mm -hmm. and I go to immigration court, and they say, uh, Mr. Keller, you're undocumented. Uh, we're going to send you back to Russia. Mm -hmm. Make it simple. Sure. Or can you pick another country where you'd like to go? Can I do that? Well, they, they do uh, afford you that option when, when you're in, in uh, removal proceedings. They, they ask you, you know, if you are to be removed from the United States, what, what, na what nation would you like to be removed to? Um, legally, the only, the only nation that's going to accept you is the one that you're a citizen of. So if you're a citizen of Russia, yeah, you, they can send you back to Russia, but you can't ask to go, you know, to, to Costa Rica or something like that, you know, unless you have valid permission to go there. But most folks, especially if they have a criminal record, no other country is going to allow them or accept them besides the country that they're a citizen of. If I'm undocumented and I don't have a criminal record, the very fact that I'm undocumented may be a crime, though. That's, that's it. Well, so immigration law falls under civil law, not under criminal law. So it's not a crime to be in the United States without documents. It's, it's, a civil, it's a civil violation. And what's happening in a deportation proceeding is basically uh, the government is, sunk, is seeking injunctive relief to physically remove you from the United States. It's a lawsuit. It's not a criminal proceeding. That's, that's one of the reasons they're not afforded an attorney if they can't afford one is because it is under civil law, not criminal law. OK. So suppose they say to me, uh where would you like to go? And I say, well, I want to go to Canada. <laughs> okay. Can, can you, as an immigration lawyer, help me get to Canada? Um, so I'm a U.S. immigration attorney, so I'm not allowed to practice Canadian immigration law. But what we could do is contact, and this is if you don't have crimes, because if you have crimes on your record, Canada is not going to accept you. Um, certain crimes, most crimes. Um, for example, if you have a, a, a DUI, they're not going to allow you to enter Canada, even if you're a U.S. citizen. They just they don't do that. Um, so if we were able to find you a legal path to, to immigrate to Canada, absolutely, we could have you go to Canada. But at the end of the day, it depends if the Canadian government is going to allow you to go there. Okay, so there are other avenues that are available mm -hmm. for individuals who are being deported. Right. Now, what is the process in uh, dealing with deportation? I go down to immigration naturalization they call me in and I, I'm uh, here undocumented you said they can't arrest me they can arrest you and put me in jail mm -hmm. but you said it's civil it is it is it's 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 civil in part but it's okay it's, so, it's criminal. so it, it's so it, I want you to explain that now because it's real important. That's a very important. good point. <laughs> I mean, you, that's why I brought the right, question right, up that's because, a very good point. because you said to me, well, it's civil. Right. right. And, I, and I go in there because they, they go to work and they see me in the back room there uh, cooking. Mm -hmm. And they say to my boss, hey, that guy back there, he's undocumented. And they tell me you've got to come down to immigration naturalization. Mm -hmm. Well, I have two choices. I can run, <laughs> but they're going to get me eventually. They'll catch you, yeah. Or I can go down to immigration naturalization. So I go down immigration naturalization. 
because I want to stay here because sure. I've got kids. I've got, you know, a job. I'm trying to pay my bills. Mm -hmm. uh, I got a little house. So I go down there, but I get arrested, right? Mm -hmm. Right, right. So what's the sense of going down there if I'm going to get arrested? Um, I guess the sense is you you rather do it on your on your own time, go down there rather than have them, you know, come, you know, to your house, scare the heck out of your children, scare the heck out of your wife, and just terrorize everybody. You want to avoid that, I guess, is the reason why people go to their appointments on time, check in when they're supposed to, and, you know, maybe they made the wrong decision of coming here, but at the end of the day, they want to do what's right, and if there is a path to correct their status, they want to follow that path, so they do go down and visit immigration. Well... Would you go to immigration with me as a lawyer? Absolutely. Okay. I wouldn't want you there without me. Could you prevent me from getting detained? I, I, I could try my best, but under, under the current administration, unfortunately, although the, the immigration officers, the ICE agents, do have discretion to release people that they've, that they've apprehended based on them determining that they're not a threat to, to national security, they're not a threat to persons or property, um, they can just go ahead and basically sign a couple pieces of paper and say you can go back home But every month every week you need to come back here report with me. Let me know if you're going to change your address They have that discretion um, Unfortunately since since President Trump's taken office. They've used that discretion almost never um, They've arrested mothers fathers grandmothers none of whom have any criminal convictions They lock them up and they don't use their discretion to release them and then they have an opportunity to see an immigration judge So they rot in jail for about 30 days people who have no threat to society. Um, the government pays the bill, and you know it's about 150 bucks a day for someone being locked up, so they lock this person up for 30 days, throw away a few thousand dollars, and then ultimately they get an opportunity to see an immigration judge. We get the bond motion prepared, and we get them out on bond. But you know that officer knew that they were no threat. He could have released them on his own you know, volition, and he chose not to. And this is happening more and more um, under the Trump administration. Since, since Trump took office, I've had one individual be released um, under ICE's discretion, and that's because his daughter, who was a U.S. citizen, was suffering from leukemia, and he was a bone marrow match. Other than that, they've locked up everybody, moms, grandmas, grandfathers, and then they got to see an immigration judge to get out. Okay. I want to stop the train for a minute because sure. you're running here. Sure. This is real interesting. Before President Trump took office, mm -hmm. If I'm required to go down there every month and report, mm -hmm. and I'm diligent, I'm faithful, mm -hmm. I am responsible, mm -hmm. I go every month and I report, mm -hmm. and then Trump takes office, he signs an executive order, and I go down there on my appointment day, I'm going to get locked up? There's a good chance you would, yeah. So I could have been going down there for six months, is that you correct? You could have been going down there for, for 20 years. Yeah, so what happened um, with the transition was when... Pull a little closer because I want okay. people to understand so, this. So what happened when, when President Obama was, was in the White House is he had a priority list of who we should be using our immigration dollars against. We have a finite amount of money that we are supposed to use to deport people. Um, President Obama said, I want you to use these limited funds to go after bad bad guys. I want you to go after criminals. Okay, If you guys catch grandma who's been here for 20 years, she has no criminal violations, nothing's wrong with her, release her, You know, get some information where she lives and stuff like that. You can put her in order, order of supervision, but that's not who I want you to waste money on. I want you to use our limited funds to go after the bad guys. Get the terrorists, get the drug dealers, get the rapists, get the murderers, get the bank robbers, get, get who you need to get, those people that are, that are a threat to our nation. Um, and an analogy to it would be, you know, everyday regular police officers have a great amount of discretion as to who they're going to arrest. You know, you don't see police officers running around and spending all the law enforcement dollars on, on going after litter bugs. You know, they go after who is a threat to our, to our society. And, and, and President Barack Obama said, that's exactly who I want these resources to be used against. So if you're not on my priority list, let's not worry about them. President Trump came in and basically eradicated that priority list, which was a really great list that we had. And he basically says, I want you to go after everybody. These priorities, we're done with them. There is no priority. He if, you're, if you're here and you don't have papers, get them out. He raised the cost, didn't he? He did. He, he, he burdened the system. He raised the cost. And now we have a system that was already overburdened, jammed full of folks that are absolutely no threat to us. We know they're here. They're not causing us any problems, but now he's putting them through the deportation process, where that process should be reserved for the worst of the worst. And the deportation process and going through the immigration courts is a long mm -hmm. process, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. absolutely. It can take anywhere from 18 to 24 months. Sure, on, on the light end. 
Right. So how many immigration judges do we have in Detroit? Uh, I think we have three right now. And how many do we need? <laughs> <laughs> like 13? Yeah, so. well, that's cute. I'm glad you said 13, you know, because that's about it. You see, he's, he's really jammed the system. Mm -hmm. And if people can get bonds of staying in this country and working, they, right. there's no law that says they can't work while they're on bond, is right. there? No, ab absolutely not. And when, when you file for cancellation of removal, actually right when you file that application, you're eligible for a work permit. Once you get that work permit, you can get a Social Security card and a driver's license. So, you know, he, he nabs these folks up who are absolutely no threat. He puts them in the system. They get their work permits. They get their driver's license. They get their Social Security cards, and then they wait, and they wait and they wait and some of them wait five years you know even more to see an immigration judge determine their faith I want you to understand the myth here this is real important and for those of you out there please I want you to understand this with Labor Day coming up mm -hmm. I'm an undocumented individual I'm working as a construction worker mm -hmm. in Detroit on the Metropolitan Building, which is a new building that they're going to renovate. And the mayor is very proud they're going to take this building built in the 20s, turn it into a, a resident hotel, residential hotel. So they come down there, the crew's working. Somebody says, well, I can't get a job. And there's so-and-so over there. He's undocumented. Immigration naturalization comes down, and they say, do you have papers? He says, no. Nope. And that's all he says is, no. Nope. Mm -hmm. He gets arrested. He calls your office, right? Yep. Okay, what's your number? The number would be 248-875-9770. So he calls your office, and Manny comes out, and he goes down to immigration with him. Mm -hmm. Correct? Absolutely. Or the family calls because he's been detained. Right. More often so it is the family or friends. Okay. So he's detained for two or three weeks, right? Absolutely. And you go to court and you say that this person is a person of good moral character. Right. That's number one. Right. Has a job. Mm hmm He's got a sponsor for a job. Mm hmm But he has no papers. He didn't even have a Social Security card when he was working, did he? Right. But all of a sudden... The floodgates open up, he's going to be deported, right? Right. But if he wants to go through the process, he gets the right to get a work permit, doesn't he? Absolutely. Gets the right to get a Social Security card. Right. He can get a driver's license. Absolutely. And he can go back to work. Right. And it might take three or four years. Even longer, yeah, absolutely, before he sees an immigration judge to actually have his full final hearing. So the point I'm making is why is the President of the United States wasting all this time and money when he's not accomplishing anything? I think he's trying to, to burden some folks that he's going after. I think he's trying to make life as hard as possible on, on them and their families in the hopes that they might just give up the fight and, and go home voluntarily. Um, but from what I've understood from the clients that I've had, these are some of the bravest human beings that, that I've ever known and I don't think they're going to you know, just give up the fight and go back to a country where their children are going to be forced to join gangs or forced to be prostitutes. You know, any, any mother or father who's coming from an environment like that will do anything to provide the best life for their children and they're not going to stop fighting. So the point I'm making is that he's acting like a businessman <laughs> <laughs> and he's not... <laughs> I guess. You know, he, he's a making, bad businessman, but yeah. He, he's making what I consider bad business decisions, right. and he's not functioning as the President of the United I, States. I would agree with that statement, absolutely. And he is so anti American when he does this, isn't absolutely. he? Absolutely, absolutely. Now, this is the Labor Day weekend, and this is the reason I wanted you to on because all of us are the products of immigrants. Mm hmm. And go look in the mirror, and if you say to yourself today, I'm not the product of an immigrant family, you're wrong. We're right. all immigrants in this right. country. Right. That's how this country was started. Mm -hmm. In fact, it was started with illegals. Could you imagine if there was an immigration court mm -hmm. 
when the pilgrims, when the pilgrims came to this country, how many pilgrims would have been sent back home? All of them. Because they had committed crimes. I mean, genocide's a pretty big crime, so yeah, <laughs> I think they'd all been sent back home. But, you know, back then, the, the natives, they weren't politically minded. They wanted to do good by all people. So they welcomed the pilgrims onto this land, and we know what happened after that, you know. But, you know, they, they, were, they were greeted warmly, and they weren't trying to politicize anything. You know, if you, if you had something to contribute to this land, you were welcomed here. The only important rule, and should never be forgotten in this country, is that we have consistently, from the founding fathers of this country, required that you must be born in the United States to be president of the United States. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Um, I think so. I'm pretty sure it is, but I, I couldn't tell you 100%. But well, you know, as far as I that, can remember, it's been a rule. <laughs> but that, that, that's the rule, right. and that's, that's the rule of right. this, because Alexander Hamilton could not be right, right. president of the United States, and this is just a little history lesson for you, because he was born in the West Indies. Right. Okay. The point I'm making is that the pilgrims would have been rejected. Mm -hmm. These people are here, and they're going to be rejected. Mm -hmm. Manny, thanks for coming. Tell Thank people you. once you so again much. how to get a hold of you, and if you can't represent them, I understand that you work with these legal aid groups. Right. I'm, I'm the board chair for Justice for Our Neighbors. I am... Uh, linked with a lot of other nonprofit organizations. So if, if they don't have funds to hire a private attorney, by all means, give me a call and I'll link you up with a great nonprofit that will still represent you. Could you have a better promise than somebody who's going to link you up? It's consistent with our format for this show to help you help yourself and help your neighbors. Give me your number. Uh, I can be reached at 248 875 9770. And thanks for coming today. Thank Have you. a great weekend. Thank you for having me. Okay, we'll see you next week.